Hey, what's up? My name's Andy. I'm from the PLR Podcast. I'm recording at a different place. I'm recording from Fort Bonehead, which is on Wickenden Street, where me and my boneheaded roommate live. And uh, I'm going to do an article today by Theodore Adorno. It's called Freudian Theory and the Pattern of Fascist Propaganda by Theodore Adorno. And to start off, I want to give a preface by uh, Foucault, which is actually a preface to another book called Anti-Oedipus by uh, Deleuze and Gutierrez, I think is how it's pronounced. It goes, during the, le- during the years of 1945 to 1965, and I am referring to Europe, there was a certain way of thinking correctly, a certain style of political discourse, a certain ethics of the individual. One had to be on familiar terms with Marx and not let one's dreams stray too far from Freud. I feel like that really sums up Adorno. Um, this article was written in 1951. He was one of the founders of the Frankfurt School. He is a uh, leftist and an intellectual and a philosopher and a social critic. The Frankfurt School was a school where they tried to patch up the holes in Marxist armor with social theory and uh, Freudian insight, which this article is full of. And he tries to show, Adorno tries to show, that the mindset of fascism is really psychoanalysis in reverse. And to do that, he really tries to define all these different things, like what is fascist propaganda, and what's the relationship between the person and uh, the fascist propaganda agitator, and where those people feel like they belong in that community and how that community is formed, and what turns these masses into masses and whatnot. So to start off, Adorno tries to summarize what fascist propaganda is, and he does it with this quote. First, with the exception of some bizarre and completely negative recommendations to put aliens into concentration camps or to expatriate Zionists, fascist propaganda material in this country, he's speaking of America, is little concerned with concrete and tangible political issues. The overwhelming majority of all agitator statements are directed ad hominem. He goes on to state that They are obviously based on psychological calculations rather than the intention to gain followers through rational statement of aims. Hey, that all makes sense to us, right? Because how many times have you heard a fascist fucking make sense about anything or talk about anything that wasn't straight fucking hatred? Uh, Adorno actually goes on to say in a different part of this that you only need to listen to one fascist to know what all the fascists are saying because this is the second element of fascist propaganda is that it's just a constant regurgitating of the same propaganda the same bullshit the same hate speech and this is seen in every fascist platform so going forward he asks what makes these masses of people um, come together what is this unity between them because it's obvious that there's a lot of fucking hatred going on, and how do people come together and unite as a group into a a collective? How do you create a collective out of all of this really abrasive, angry, narcissistic, paranoid energy? So, Freud rejects this uh, hypothesis that it's all just some herd instinct or social idea, that it's just easy for humans just to regress into this rabble-rousing kind of just thrown up and invigorated mass of idiocy. He thinks that it's more complicated than that. He thinks that that kind of like a mass group of people that can be very aggressive, that is the product of something. That's not like the solution. And Adorno goes on to say that in this society in which we live, we're raised as individuals. We are, as he says, uh, rugged and warned against surrender. Uh, We are brought up to be self-sustaining units. Um, I know that I was told to pull myself up by my bootstraps and to make something of myself. And I was told that it was a dog-eat-dog world and all these other things, too. And if we are grown in this environment where we are told to be so isolated, how do we come together under this uniting banner, and how do they come together under this hateful uniting banner? Adorno puts it out and says, 
for the fascist demagogue who has to win the support of millions of people for aims largely incompatible with their own rational self-interest, can do only so by artificially creating the bond that Freud was looking for. So something has to be there. It has to be artificially made, and it's going to be based on something that's not a logical or rational solution to anything in anyone's lives. It's really just uh, picking a target and putting a floodlight on them and blaming them for everyone's issues. And Freud being Freud, he makes this connection into saying that it's a libidinal relationship. So where you direct this libidinal energy is important because it also, um, it's a part of you. Adorno makes a note here where he says, the libidinal pattern of fascism and the entire technique of fascist demagogues are authoritarian. And he follows that up with an example from Freud. Freud says, by the measures that he takes, the hypnotist awakens in the subject a portion of his archaic inheritance, which had also made him compliant towards his parents, which had experienced an individual reanimation in his relation to his father. What is thus awakened is the idea of a paramount and dangerous personality toward whom only a passive masochistic attitude is possible. There you go. I think that sounds pretty fucking authoritarian. And of course, with Freud, things go back to daddy. Moving forward still, Adorno summarizes with, Fascist agitation is centered in the idea of the leader, no matter whether he actually leads or is only a mandatory of group interests, because only the psychological image of the leader is apt to reanimate the idea of the all-powerful and threatening primal father. So how is this libidinal connection done? How is it formed? It doesn't sound very fun, so how the fuck does it happen? It happens through a process of identification. Now, this is a very important word. Um, this is a not projection. This is not pushing your identity onto another person. This is a relationship of seeing yourself in someone else. And that comes back to the hate speech, uh, where you have these internal irrational beliefs and that you see someone who is saying these from a mountaintop in a position of power, you tend to identify with them and they become a image of you that you wish you were. This is a person who's saying everything you always wanted to say, uh, a person who is powerful and political and listened to and gets respect. And you feel like a lot of the things in your life that were not realized in your empirical life, your empirical reality, you can look at this person and say, they're doing it, they're like me, that means that I can do it, that means I am great. So you kind of have this warped kind of relation to this person, uh, this fascist agitator, because they hold certain qualities that you have. And this goes back to an analogy that he made, uh, that Freud made and Adorno made, about the great little man. Uh, Hitler's great little man idea was that he was a, a street barber and at the same time King Kong. He is, I am one of you, and I am also this powerful force of nature that can do more than you. So people related to him, and they identified with him, and he became a part of their identity. Uh, as that becomes stronger and stronger, it comes into, as Adorno calls, an act of devouring. And this act of devouring is, quote, uh, the making of a beloved object a part of oneself. This devouring, this identification, is also an idealization. Um, Freud goes on to say, We see that the object, which is the agitator, is being treated in the same way as our own ego, so that when we are in love, a considerable amount of narcissistic libido overflows onto the object. It is even obvious in many forms of love choice that the object serves as a substitute for some unattained ego ideal of our own. Adorno sums this up very, very well. He says that this, again, falls in line with the semblance of the leader image to an enlargement of the subject by making the leader his ideal he loves himself, as it were, but gets rid of the stains of frustration and discontent which mar the picture of his own empirical self. This pattern of self-identification through idealization, the caricature of true, conscious solidarity, is, however, a collective one. It is effective in vast numbers of people with similar characterological dispositions and libidinal leanings. 
the fascist community of the people corresponds exactly to Freud's definition of a group as being a number of individuals who have substituted one and the same object for their ego ideal and have consequently identified themselves with one another in their ego. What ends up happening is very interesting. It allows these people to become both the oppressor and the oppressed at the same time. It allows them to have this like sadomasochistic kind of uh, personality and an authoritarian personality. It's maintained from this point that this kind of relationship between the fascist agitator and the follower is a very uh, narcissistic and powerful one, and that by belonging to this group, the follower feels like they are better and more pure than their peers, and they also simultaneously hate people that do not adhere to this fascist ideology. Um, people that don't adhere to the fascist ideology don't see themselves in the fascist who's leading the people, and if they can't identify with them, then they can't be accepted into this collective of individuals who all identify with the same figurehead. So it becomes a us-versus-them mentality, and it drives for um, the fascist destruction of non-believers, basically, and this happens in religion, and it happens with every other I ideology, as Adorno states uh, a few times in this essay. And it also shows that the people who all have this in common, this kind of adoration of the same figure and the same narcissistic energy going into that figure because they identify with that figure, even if there are differences between them on different levels, it's washed away by this uh, unity of belief. And as we know that fascist propaganda is mainly running around one theme, and that's just hateful rhetoric about some xenophobic or anti-semitic target the rhetoric turns into a spear point where the most e efficient insults rise to the top um you could imagine the things that trump has said about individual people uh crooked hillary catch on uh words and phrases um that tend to be kind of um criticized and seen as kind of silly after a while uh the germans had a term Blut und Boden, which means blood and soil. And people joked about it and called it blue bow and that kind of thing. And they thought it was ridiculous. But uh, nevertheless, it still held, held meeting. And uh, it was still a part of that fascist um, speak that was a part of the culture. And it was kind of internalized by a lot of people. And um, people tended to believe it, even if they kind of joked about saying it and they thought it was kind of silly, it's still kind of solidified within them. So the propaganda is a huge uh, tool used to hammer these details and hammer these words and beliefs, even though you already had them and you're already identifying with them, but to make them deeper and more concrete inside of you, no matter how irrational they are. Sometimes, as Adorno says, these policies might be things like uh, contradictory interests for uh, the material needs for the people. So people riding on this hate wave and not realizing that they're being taken advantage of economically. Um, another one of these um, aspects is that threat of impending war or doom. And that can be a war overseas or it can be a race war or it can be uh, a war against another political party, uh, someone that's threatening your existence, an existential threat. And lastly, it's um, just this constant cyclone of propaganda that just uh, crystallizes these terrible fucking paranoid delusions. And this entire time you're being rewarded by the success of this fascist because you see yourself as that fascist and you have this really terrible symbiotic relationship which totally ignores the rational and logic parts of your mind which should be discovered and fostered with psychoanalysis and instead is pushed into the needs and wants of this uh figurehead this fascist who you might think is the kind of guy that you get a beer with on a Friday night, you know, because you guys, you know, would like to shoot the shit and you'd probably get along because you feel the same way a lot of, about a lot of stuff. But, uh, no, you're just being taken for a ride by a fucking sociopath.
who is able to speak his way into your hearts by identifying with your economic or social or religious life and playing on your hatred and turning you into a monster just like him. And it happens without you realizing it, and it happens in a way that you're almost excited for it to happen. And it's truly terrifying the way that this works with people. And uh, I don't know a good way to combat fascism. This article tells me a lot about how it happens to people and how it affects people's minds and how it really does terrible things to their, uh, their personality and how they become uh, masses. But, man, I wish it fucking had a solution, right? That wasn't found in a clip of a fucking Mosin Nagant or something like that. Well, that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I have a lot of resources as far as lectures and other podcasts that I can recommend about this. I'll see if I can get them in the link and that kind of thing. As well as a free copy of this article if you're so inclined to read it. It's approachable. It doesn't use a lot of terms that you're not going to be familiar with. And it's written in a pretty straightforward way. Uh, Adorno does a pretty good job. So check it out. And uh, thanks for listening.